I think it's been, it's become commonplace in the United States to equate innovation with Silicon Valley, and I don't think that's always fair. There are multiple kinds of innovation, and if you look at kind of at, at China's national innovation goals, they aren't necessarily to develop the kind of you know, ecosystem that Silicon Valley represents, but they're still trying to have a, an innovative ecosystem. You, you can go back as far as you want, you can say, well, the United States has the biggest, the most successful innovative ecosystem that's out there, but you know, you go back a few years, and I remember the conversation between Richard Nixon as vice president and and Khrushchev in China, where after Sputnik, where where Nixon said, "Well, you know, you guys may have uh, be be ahead of us in in space, but you know, we're ahead of you in color TV." So there's a, there's a, there are different kinds of innovations, and I think you know, in the United States, I think we've clearly become very good at the kind of commercialized innovation that drives economy, drives new ventures, and that kind of thing. Um, China um, doesn't seem to value that much, uh, that as much as kind of the big, you know, national, uh, national goals, grand frontier innovations, rather than the kind of incremental innovation that they've actually become very, very good at. Um, I, I think it's, you know, there's an old canard that, that uh, you know, China can't be as innovative or Asian countries can't be as innovative because their educational system kind of relies on rote learning as opposed to, you know, the kind of free-flowing, creative education that a country like the United States prides itself on. Uh, I think in practice a lot of, a lot of Chinese innovation is, is quite groundbreaking. Uh, it's just not as groundbreaking as you, you as I think a lot of Chinese that want to see the the frontier innovations and see China as really at, at the at the the forefront of, of kind of global innovation that that uh, that they aspire to I think some come and it's both I mean Chinese are I mean, most Chinese that uh, you know have taken the sea turtle route and become educated overseas in some engineering or other field and have gone back to China to become successful entrepreneurs, successful technologists. They do obviously start from a Chinese educational base. Uh, the Chinese uh, educational system for kind of advanced engineering, advanced science is not as good as the United States, and so it's natural that uh, that Chinese entrepreneurs or Chinese scientists come to the United States for advanced training. Um, whether they go back is is a function of of whether there's opportunity. And I think many of them found that there has been great opportunity for for entrepreneurs and, and technologists. Um, whether that's in China's state sector with with uh, space technology or military technology, or even in China's internet sector, which is you know the wild west and is is really quite quite extraordinary. Um, so I, I think it's it's a combination um, of of east and west and and uh, but I think uh, one of the telling signs is that any really successful Chinese venture or technology venture has at its core. Uh, Chinese that have been educated in the West. I think um, compared to other parts of Asia, they're probably pretty similar. Um, you know, getting a business off the ground has become easier in China for, for new ventures. Uh, so starting a new technology company, an internet company in China is relatively easy, but once you've started it, having access to things like uh, banking services or legal services or, or the kind of capital services that venture capitalists provide is a lot harder. Um, the, the infrastructure for supporting innovations is far underdeveloped when you, you look at, at the United States, Europe, or even, even uh, more advanced parts of Asia, Korea, and Japan. Uh, so they face, they face uh, fewer burdens than, say, in Vietnam or, or even in, in Indonesia or even India. But uh, by and large, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese government has recognized that getting you know, entrepreneurs into solution, getting their technology into commercial solution is good for employment. It's good for the Chinese economy generally. And so I think they're trying to do the, to do the right thing in terms of improving, improving uh, services for entrepreneurs at that level. Well, being a uh, 
a market, a pro-market Westerner. I mean, my, the natural inclination is to say that um, it, it, unless China really uh, allows for a much more open and free, and I use that word advisedly, uh, information system. In other words, the ability to exchange information not just with other entrepreneurs within China, but across geographies, across um, across technology platforms, is really very important. And I think that's 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 a place where China has has fallen down. If you talk to Chinese entrepreneurs or even Chinese researchers, whether in academic fields or otherwise, the com most common complaint is is the, the constrictions on their ability to access information, uh, technical or otherwise, that, that is critical to moving their businesses forward, moving their research forward. So I, I think that's the, you know, again, displaying my Western bias, I think that uh, better information flows and more access to information is, is probably the thing that is likely to hold China uh, back in terms of reaching its innovation goals over the next three to five years. It's in the wrong direction now, for sure. Uh, and I think we all understand, you know, the, the political sensitivities that are involved and, and the realities that are involved in, in trying to manage a, uh, a, uh, a wild and woolly group of, of Chinese and, uh, entrepreneurs and, and technologists um, as they get out there. But I think it really is a, it's a, it's a problem that, uh, that they may find will, will come to hurt them. Mm -hmm.